what made Eden such a perfect environment? I'm going to submit to you that as we learn from the text this morning, what we're going to see is that it's God's provision and humanity's productivity. Things that we have lost after the fall. Let's look at Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 8. Reading from this morning from the English Standard Version. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Delium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is the Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. This is the word of God, inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, then on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing here to the reading of his word this morning. What we see in this passage is that God made a garden. God made a garden. And this puts on display for us three things that I'd like to demonstrate for you from the text this morning. First of all, God is a God of provision. God provides. And you see it right here as verse 8 starts, as this passage starts. God plants a garden, and what does he plant in it? What is there? It says in verse 9, every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. So he is concerned about the aesthetic quality, I guess we could say. We aren't quite at that level of spring. It felt pretty good yesterday. Uh, maybe some of you were out doing some yard work and different things. The, the sun was shining. We had some good warm temperatures. You get outside and you see the trees budding. But we haven't blossomed yet. That's still coming. But this is going to be, in the next few weeks unfolding in front of us, one of the best times to be here in the north when all the, the flowering fruit trees start coming out, the smells that are there, and some of you are maybe watching this even from home because some of the allergies get keyed up too, I suppose, this time of year. But it's a beautiful sight to behold. It's a fragrant thing to take in. Also, though, what springs up in the garden? It's things for Adam and Eve to eat. Because... What God commissions them to, and we'll talk about it in just a moment, is he, he wants them to work the garden, to keep the garden. It's got to be productive. But right away, they have things to sustain them, ways to nourish them. And this is something we don't often think about. But God, when we think of God in our modern context, we want to think of a God who works miracles, a God who does tremendous and exceptional and amazing things. And we don't really think how much we take for granted. And now Scripture lays out that the very reason that we exist today, the things that make us able to live our life, is because God provides that for us. The food that we eat is because of the cycles of God's provision. You see that laid out for us several times in Scripture. For example, when Noah is getting off the ark, it says in the promise that God gives to him, while the earth remains, Genesis 8, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. So he gives the cycles where these things are raised and productive and able for us 
to consume, the necessities of life. Psalm 145, the psalmist says this in verse 15, The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. This is the work of God. That again, so often we take for granted. Sometimes, you know, like you're like the old farmer in Steinbeck's The the Grapes of Wrath, and they're sitting down to give a prayer before the meal, and he says, well, why should I thank God for the meal? I'm the one who plowed the field. I'm the one who planted it. I'm the one who harvested it. What do I have to thank God for? And that all too often is probably the cynical attitude that people have. What's up with this God? We're the ones who do all the work. We're the ones who do all this thing. Why do we credit him? But we know, even this year, what have we been waiting for? What have we been lamenting? I mean, other than people are kind of glad we haven't had a lot of snow. It's been a pretty easy winter. But even now, why are we kind of not complaining about it as much when we've had all this precipitation? Because it's been dry. We need the moisture. We need things to replenish the earth. And as much as we blame the weather guys, it's not up to them. We are relying on God's provision. These are things that he makes clear. He makes available to us. These are not just Old Testament concepts. This is what Paul would remind as he's preaching in Acts chapter 14 and verse 17. Yet he did not leave himself without witness. He's talking to an audience trying to persuade them that this is the God you need to believe in because he says, this God did good to you by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful season, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Make no mistake about it, friends. The work that God does, the way that he demonstrates himself includes what you're going to sit down to eat this afternoon after you get out of here. Whether you're going to a restaurant or you're going home and getting something out of the crock pot, you're going to make yourself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich because you didn't do the work that you should have last night. God has given you the sustenance that you need for life. And we ought to give him the glory and the praise for it. And he has done so from the beginning of creation. Not only does he put trees in the garden and give Adam something to do, he gives him resources so these plants, these trees, are going to be sustained. He puts a river in the middle of it to water and nourish the garden. By this, at this point in time, there's not rain. Of course, we know that's coming later on. It's going to be part of God's judgment on the earth, but still we understand that the way that God nourishes us and nourishes and replenishes the earth today is through that kind of precipitation, and the Psalms support that. In Psalm 65, verse 9, it says, you visit the earth and you water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide their grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. Your wagon tracks overflow with abundance. The pastures of the wilderness overflow. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. The metaphor that he's giving is whether you're driving through the, cow, the countryside and you see the cows and, you know, if you're a dad, what do you got to do? You, you moo <laughs> as you go by because the kids love it. Or maybe they roll their eyes. I don't know if they're, they're in their teens now. Maybe they, it's getting old. But what do you look when you see the cattle in the fields or you're driving through uh, south central Minnesota or, or, or a field out in Iowa and you you know before you get there that there's something coming because you can detect the odor in the air. That's bacon, (laughs) eventually. But you know what? Those things are reminders of God's goodness. And what it says here in the Psalms, it likens it to a song, an attitude of rejoicing. That's something that, again, how, how much do we think of that as a worship experience 
to smell some of those what we might think of as offensive odors. My wife, when we were uh, back in, uh, going through Bible college down in uh, Iowa, she had the opportunity, I think I've shared this as an illustration before, where she had the opportunity to work for a hog farmer. Uh, he had uh, several acres of corn that he fed, or, or corn that he raised, and then 700 head of sow back then, along with all the others that would come in. And his wife had died and left him with four children under the age of 10 uh, when she passed away suddenly. And so my wife had the opportunity to be the caregiver to the children uh, while he and his farm hands ran the farm. And part of her duty, among other watching the, the children, was to prepare meals. And they'd come in for lunch, and she had to get used to the odor. They, they'd have cologne and stuff out there to try to mask it, but she said it, it wasn't doing the trick. And she says after a while, she got used to it, but she could still always sense it when she came in. So she asked one of the farmhands one day, she says, how do you learn to live with it? How can you stand to be around this odor all day long? And he just looks at her and smiles and says, Jennifer, that's the smell of money. <laughs> but what do we have? in that. That's maybe we could say from a Christian point of view, from a biblical point of view, that's one of the things that God gives us as reminders to rejoice. That's the way His creation is functioning in such a way where we can enjoy the bounty of what God has supplied for us. Another psalm, Psalm 104, verse 10, you make springs gush forth in the valleys. They flow between the hills. They give drink to every beast of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. Beside them, the birds of the heavens dwell. They sing among the branches. From your lofty abode, you water the mountains. The earth is satisfied with the fruit of your work. You cause the grass to grow for the livestock and plants for man to cultivate, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine to gladden the heart of man. There's a difficult passage for some of us Baptists there, but we'll keep going. Oil to make his face shine and bread to strengthen man's heart. The trees of the Lord are watered abundantly, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. In them the birds build their nests, the stork has her home in the fir trees. The high mountains are for the wild goats. The rocks are a refuge for the rock badgers. And what do we see even in there? God's provision for his creation. Things for us to appreciate, things to sustain ourselves and bring us joy and pleasure. God is the sustainer of his creation. But God also, here as he lays out the Garden of Eden for his humanity for the ones created in his image also clearly communicates with them god provides god sustains and god communicates how does he do that you see in the text that he's giving them not just the description of what he's giving to adam and eve but now in the context of those of us who are reading it later though we don't know particularly all the context of the river Pishon, the river Gihon, those are not in existence as far as we know today. What we do know is that Scripture is presenting Eden as a real place. Because even to this day, we can go to the Middle East and find that there is a Tigris River and a Euphrates River in the Middle East. We know that whatever else the original audience that Genesis would have been read by would have understood the context of Pishon and Gihon, the land of Havilah, and they would have understood the Cush. They would have had the frame of reference to realize that this is not just the stuff of myth and legend. This is what God did to establish himself. He communicated that Eden was a historical place that they could have in a frame of reference. But he also communicates to Adam and Eve a specific set of rules to follow. You have these things for your benefit. Here is what you need to keep in mind. And so, do not eat of the tree. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. There is an expectation and there is a consequence. Now, Today, do we live under the same tight restrictions? You could make an argument that what we celebrated here this morning reminds us 
that it is not according to what we do or what we do not do that gains us access to God and heaven. No, it is believing on the Son, believing in His sacrifice that gives us access to God. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, Jesus says, except through me. We believe in Jesus. We will not perish, but have everlasting life. This is the gospel message. But is God not concerned with our behavior? No, time and again, for the Christian, there are admonitions to believe. Paul says to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, As for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed. And he's not asking him just to keep grasping the intellectual ideas. He says, keep living the way that I've taught you to live. If you believe it, the intellectual concepts about Jesus, then your life should match. James says, faith without works is dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Last week we were in 1 Corinthians 15 talking about the resurrection. That chapter concludes with the reality of the resurrection. What should you do? What should your conclusion be? Not just looking forward to the day, one day when your dead relatives will rise again. If you die, you'll rise again be with Jesus. He says, in light of what Jesus has accomplished, verse 58 of 1 Corinthians 15, therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. He wants them to conform. He wants them to obey. He wants them to have their lives match and reflect Jesus Christ and the transforming work that he's doing in their lives. And so we reference James. Faith without work is dead. What does that look like? James 1.27 Religion that is pure and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So, there is a moral category that we follow. There's also a generosity category that we follow. So, for the Christian, we shouldn't just be soaking it in all the time, seeing and being the recipients of what everybody else's generosity comes to us, we should be giving. We should be extending ourselves. One of the verses that we, as our family, took into mind very seriously was James 127 when we started down our trail of foster care and adoption that has impacted and redefined our family because of what it says here. Now, does that mean that the rest of you who haven't done that yet, yet, uh, are being disobedient? Not necessarily, but we all should be looking for ways to fulfill the spirit of what he's saying, whether you're doing adoption, whether you're being generous with your resources to help others in need, visiting the widows, finding people who are in need of your generosity, whether you're sharing material resources, time resources, investing in their care. This should be the thing that defines the follower of Jesus Christ. We've learned that as we've worked through our study in 1 Thessalonians that we've been going through on the Wednesday night Bible study. By the way, I know that not many of you are coming, but more of you ought to consider coming. We're meeting in the fellowship right in the hall right now around some tables, and we're getting a really good opportunity to dig into 1 Thessalonians. But one of the blessings of my week, to be quite honest, is being able to listen to that 20-some people just pray out loud. And just to hear how God is working in lives and moving in lives. It's been a great time of encouragement. And those of you who aren't coming, you're really missing a blessing. If we get more of you, we'll we'll work around it. Maybe we'll have to start a second set of tables. But we would love to have you join us on Wednesday nights. But that reminds us in 1 Thessalonians that if God is communicating with us, just like he expects from Adam and Eve, he expects them to stay within the boundaries, within the parameters that he's established. And that's the next point on your outline. If God made a garden, he wanted them to stay in bounds. He wanted them, as he says, to work it and to keep it and to take and see it develop into all its full potential. Just like God expected Adam to be productive and Eve to be productive, 
He expects that from Christians today. This is where I was going with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which we've just recently studied on Wednesday nights. It says in verse 9, Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you're doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. So, taking a step back, he's commending, Paul is commending the Thessalonians because they have resources and they're sharing them with others in need. You know what it means to love each other. You know what it means to love outside of your four walls. But, he says, speaking to the whole congregation, because he realizes that even in that congregation, some had the capability of being more generous than others, while others were the recipients of that generosity. And listen to what he says. We urge you, brothers, verse 10, the end of verse 10 of chapter 4, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands, as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. That is to say, Paul is saying, you should be grateful for sometimes the opportunity that others have to invest in your need and your time, but the general principle is not that you are always the recipient and others are the givers. The general principle is that you should walk in such a way where you're working with your hands, you're providing for yourself, so you have to give to others in need and not always be the recipient. Be quiet. Mind your own affairs. That is, take responsibility for yourself so that you can be in a position to be not just responsible for yourself, but to give out of the overflow of the abundance that God has given you when you are productive. Are we saying that everybody can be productive in the same way? Everybody has the same capabilities? No. But we are saying there is a general expectation for the Christian to be in a position to give. He should aspire, she should aspire to fulfill that function. This is part of what it means to be the body of Christ. Don't be a burden. Endeavor to be a blessing. This is the expectation that Paul sets down for those who serve in church leadership in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8. If anyone does not provide for his relatives and especially for the members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. In a day where it's easy in our society to be freeloading and to get benefits and all these other things for not putting very much effort out, Christians need to be realizing that we have been given a gift by God, gifts of food, gifts of provision, gifts of strength, that God's given to us for a reason. God wants us to be productive, and when we are not doing that, we are not fulfilling the expectation that God gives us. We are not to be slothful in business. The contrast is we serve the Lord. We are productive. God has us designed to work and keep right from the beginning of creation, and then he gives them a command to obey. And if we are faithful believers, we are also going to follow in what God's expectations were for Adam in listening to his word. Now, did Adam and Eve do it? No. They reaped the consequences of it. Did Jesus restore it? Yes, he did. And we look to him by believing. But if we do not come to him in faith. We are ultimately rejecting him. And some of you here, friends, today might need to hear this, might need to be reminded of this. If you believe in the Son, Jesus himself says at the end of John chapter 3, you have life. But John 3.36 also says, the translation of the ESV is, whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God remains on him. Some have objected to that translation because some of you have translations that say he who does not believe will not see life. But there is a link here between belief and practice. If you reject Jesus, you are not believing in his command to believe. You are not believing in his command to exercise faith. He is the only way. He is the only truth. He is the only life. 
And he compels you to believe in the gospel, to turn from your sins and to trust in him. You're not going to earn your way to heaven by doing anything else but believing in him. But friend, if you do believe in him, he's going to help you to change. He's going to work his fruit in your life and help you with a community of believers surrounding you who are going to care for you, who are going to love you, but provide for you an example of what you should be doing too. That's what we just read before communion. That's the expectation God has for our lives. And so, what we are reminded of as we look at the conclusion of the message this morning, the thing I want you to remember more than anything else that we've talked about this morning is that when God created the garden, when he created Eden, it was a paradise. But Eden was lost because of Adam's sin and death. We're looking ahead now, but we know that we're not in that perfect environment anymore. But what we do also remember is what we lost can be regained. Heaven is gained because of what Jesus did for us on the cross, what we remembered here by faith in Jesus' death for sin. When we believe on him, we will have life. And we can look forward one day to the time where we will feast, as we sang earlier in the service today, and weep no more. God will wipe away all tears from our eyes and there will be no more sorrow, no more pain, no more death. Those things will have passed away. We will sing, as we will in just a moment, the hymn of heaven. We thank you, Father, for these encouragements from your word, even as we see what you always intended for humanity from the beginning of creation. We know that through our own efforts and through our own choices, we put ourselves in a position of disobedience and rebellion and reap the consequences that we deserve. Your word tells us that the wages of sin, the payment that we receive, is death. Separation from you, the reality of physical death, the reality of eternal and conscious suffering in hell and in the lake of fire. We do not have to accept those consequences. Because of what your son did for us on the cross, we can be forgiven. We can have eternal life. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord can be saved and will be saved if they believe. So Lord, work in the hearts of people even here this morning, seeing in the contrast of their lives, their selfishness, their greed, their pride and satisfaction and being able to supply for themselves and not be able to see how everything they have is something you have given to them, something you have provided. Lord, humble us and help us to realize that you are the God who blesses us all and makes yourself available through the death of your Son for us to be called your children. Lord, make us people of faith. Help us to believe in Jesus' name.